Let's do the music today. Three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning. Good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports, episode 492. Welcome into my podcasting pickup truck. Hello. Uh, doing very well today. And uh, there's a couple There's a couple things to talk about. Not a lot. It's kind of a dead zone right now in the NFL world. Um, got one big story. We'll talk about Formula One a lot at the end, so you can skip it if you want to. We'll do a segment you guys seemed to love last week, which was uh, sports screenshots. That'll be really fun. A lot of, lot of juicy, fun stuff there. Anyone see that Zach Wilson story? I'm going to talk about it, believe it or not. We're going to have fun with it. Um, but let's start today with... Um, this is what I think is probably the biggest NFL news right now. The Patriots have traded former first-round receiver Nikhil Harry to the Chicago Bears. They traded him to the Bears for a 2024 seventh-round pick. And after being drafted in the first round, in three years with New England, Nikhil Harry made 57 catches for 598 yards and four touchdowns. That's three years worth of work and and not much to show for it. That's less than one season worth of work for many, many receivers. And uh, I was hopeful when they drafted him. He was a 32nd overall pick in 2019. He showed a lot of talent at Arizona State. And I was like, hey, this is going to be Tom Brady's new weapon. Let's go. Awesome. They finally got him a stud receiver. And it didn't work. Um, I almost wonder if it had been a home run Would Tom Brady have maybe been more enticed to stay in New England? Like, if he had this crazy good receiver with the Patriots, would he have even wanted out of New England? Would he have been willing to make it work? Who knows? Those are questions we'll never never know the answer to. But uh, Nikhil Harry was drafted ahead of DK Metcalf, Terry McLaurin, A.J. Brown, and didn't really turn into anything. It's kind of a, a massive, massive disappointment if you're a Patriots fan. And New England trading away Nikhil Harry for basically nothing. A seventh-round pick in not next year's draft, but the year after next. That feels like an admission of, yeah, this didn't really work out. At all, by the way. And they did free up like a million dollars of salary cap space by getting rid of him. But it's a it's a disappointing admission of failure, really, if you're a Patriots uh, person. And the most brutal thing you can say about Nikhil Harry is that in the last year alone... Last year, 2021, Jacoby Myers caught more passes for more yards than Nikhil Harry did in three years. So Jacoby Myers was an undrafted free agent receiver signed in 2019, the same year Nikhil Harry was drafted. So while Nikhil Harry was a first round pick in three years, Nikhil Harry put up 57 catches for 598 yards in just last year alone, just one year, an undrafted free agent receiver, Jacoby Myers had 83 catches for 866 yards. I mean... It's kind of pathetic. It's very, very sad. And I I don't want to... I don't know. It just didn't work for Nikhil Harry. For Chicago, um, I like this trade a lot because it's very low risk and could be high reward. Nikhil Harry is physically gifted and you never know. A change of scenery could do him well. I was very critical of Chicago for not supporting their young quarterback, Justin Fields, this offseason. I thought, you know, they got a defensive-minded head coach. They got rid of Khalil Mack. They... Lost Allen Robinson. Hey, Nikhil Harry, that's better than nothing. I mean, maybe a fresh start for Chicago, a fresh start in Chicago could be good for Nikhil Harry. And he is six foot four. He's only 24 years old. Like I said, maybe he does well. There's a chance at Nikhil Harry. um, Who knows why he didn't work in New England, but maybe he works well in Chicago. But it's a decent shot in the dark for the Bears. And for New England, frankly, it's an embarrassing admission of failure. You drafted him in the first round, and you got rid of him for a seventh round pick two years from now. It's it's a not a it's a very unflattering look for the Patriots, but uh, I guess they cleared some salary cap space. And uh, like I said, I, for Justin Fields, I'm excited because this is one of the first moves the Bears have made all offseason. Where I'm like, hey, they're getting something, anything at all for their young quarterback, and we'll cross our fingers, we'll we'll, we'll pray to whatever Chicago Bears God there is, and say maybe that. Maybe Nikhil Harry turns into a star receiver for the Chicago Bears. I am skeptical of that. I'm doubtful of that. But there is a chance, and let's admit it. Um, But the real story here is that the Patriots had a first-round receiver that did not at all 
live up to their expectations. All right. Um, I did this segment last week uh, for the first time. We'll do it again today. I, I really enjoy it. I liked it so much. I moved it up earlier in the podcast. It is called Sports Screenshots. I see a lot of interesting stuff on Instagram, and I want to share that with you here today on the podcast. And we'll go through a screenshot. Number one is this. The CBS Sports put this on Instagram. Uh, these, the caption is, the Panthers have been having quite an adventure at quarterback the last few years. Since 2019, these are the Panthers quarterbacks. They had Kyle Allen. He went 5-7. and seven. Uh, He got traded to Washington after that. Cam Newton went 0-2. Oh he got released after the year and went to the Patriots. Then Will Greer also went 0-2. Oh That's 2019. Then in 2020, they had Teddy Bridgewater. He went 4-11. and 11. Uh, He signed a $63 million deal before the year in Carolina. He got traded to Denver after just one year. So they have been trying for a while. Kyle Allen got, they got rid of him. Cam Newton. Will Greer, they drafted him. He really didn't turn into anything. Teddy Bridgewater. Gave him a big contract. He went 4-11 in 2020. They got rid of him. P.J. Walker went 1-0. He also started one game in 2020. Last year in 2021, Sam Darnold, they traded three picks to the Jets to get Sam Darnold, and he went 4-7. <laughs> Cam Newton went 0-5, which is surprising because he actually didn't start one game, but did pretty well uh, coming off the bench. And then P.J. Walker, again, went 1-0. What's kind of sad here, so the overall record for the Panthers... Since 2019 is 15 and 34. Not a lot of wins, a lot of bad quarterback play, a lot of moments of hope. Hey, maybe Teddy Bridgewater's our guy. Hey, uh, we brought Cam back. Maybe Cam will be fun. Oh, maybe Sam Darnold. Then it's just not working at all. And uh, the expected starting quarterback for 2022 this year for the Panthers is quarterback Baker Mayfield. By the way, Baker Mayfield gave a quote. Um, he said, apparently, here's something I missed in all of the Baker Mayfield trade. We'll call it drama, but really the, the saga, whatever it's been. Baker Mayfield got traded from the Cleveland Browns to the Carolina Panthers. And apparently, I didn't realize this. I'm going to double, let's double check this right now on Google. Apparently, Panthers and Browns play each other week one, which, let's see, week one. Is that real? Do they really play each other week one? They really do. I don't know. that. That's unbelievable to me that I missed that somehow. Baker Mayfield gets to play his old team, the Cleveland Browns, week one of the NFL season in a couple, like in a month and a half or so. I, I, oh my goodness, that is incredible. I'm very excited. Baker Mayfield said this about that game. He told uh, Darren, Grant, uh, Darren Gant, he said, I'm not going to sit here and be a robot and tell you it's not one I've already marked on my calendar. He said it's, I'm not going to sit here and be a robot and tell you that's not one I've marked on the calendar already. So Baker is fired up to play his old team. Somehow I missed that. And uh, incredibly exciting. I cannot wait to see Baker Mayfield play his former team. Like I said, I've been very um, cautious about Baker Mayfield going to Carolina. I don't know that it's going to be great for him. I hope it's awesome. I'm not sure it will be. But uh, it, let, let's say it goes well. I mean... The idea of Matt Rule, a coach who... Someone put this somewhere on one of my YouTube comments. They're like, you know, Matt Rule in Carolina is a coach with the backup against the ball. Baker Mayfield does well as an underdog. Hey, maybe it goes well. I'm excited, but I'll tell you who I'm rooting for week one. I want the Carolina Panthers to beat the snot out of the Cleveland Browns. I don't know that that's going to happen. But, hey, I think that would be chaotic and fun if Baker beat his old team. And I am all for that. Okay, sports screenshot number two. Let's, uh, let's give some shine to a small Instagram account, The Berg News. I like them a lot. They're really good. Hines and the Steelers did not come to an agreement on a contract extension to remain the team sponsor, meaning the stadium will be under a new name for 2022. The new name for the stadium could be announced as early as this week. We did get that announcement. The Steelers said, we are excited to announce that our home has been renamed. And I don't, I hate this name so much. Acrisure Stadium. I think I said that right. I don't know. What is Acrisure? Let me let me Google that. I'm really curious. I, I have no idea what Acrisure is. Acrisure. It's an insurance company. How lovely. How lovely. From ketchup to insurance. I, uh, Heinz Field was fun. I'm sad that, uh, that came to an end. But Heinz Field is no more if you are a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. John Wall said this about joining the LA Clippers. This was posted by NBA uh, on ESPN. 
John Wall is ready to push the pace with the Clippers. He said, you tell me the third best defender is going to have to guard me? Good luck. They got Kawhi, they got Paul George, and now they got John Wall. And yeah, the third best defender guarding John Wall theoretically is a mismatch. So let's if John Wall can get to the Clippers and be healthy, which I, man, I, I want that so badly. I really want, I'm not a Clippers fan. I'm not an LA person. I don't care at all. I just think John Wall kind of redeeming his name and going somewhere competitive and being good would be really fun. And a lot of people doubt John Wall. A lot of people making fun of him. He's made a lot of money, hasn't played. I want to see John Wall do well with the LA Clippers. And uh, certainly John Wall thinks he's going to do well in LA. So I, man, that that's going to pull my attention to the NBA this, I guess, October is when they start the season. I can't wait to see how John Wall does with the Clippers. And uh, I'm very, very fascinated with that. How about this? Uh, CBS Sports put this. Is a, this stat is a couple days old, uh, but I, it's a good launching off point to talk about the Seattle Mariners. The Mariners are tied for a wild card playoff spot right now. At the time, they were 45 and 42. Baseball goes so quickly. It's posted two days ago. They're probably like 47 and 42 or 48 and 42. They're on a two. They're on like an eight game winning streak or something. They got a doubleheader today in Washington. Uh, but here's the thing. Why is this significant? Seattle owns the longest playoff drought in any of the four major North American pro sports. The Mariners haven't been to the playoffs since 2001. This could be the year. This could be the year the Mariners make it back. And uh, I, I look, I, I'm living with a, a Mariners fan right now. I watched uh, a little bit of the Mariners' first game of their doubleheader in Washington today. You know, my I grew up a Mariners fan. Then I gave up on them. I, it was a brutal breakup. It was very painful for me. I'm I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm getting sucked back. I'm getting pulled back in. I I think I'm gonna go to a Mariners game. I have been watching them a little bit. It's kind of fun. Here, if you're you're maybe not a Mariners fan, most people don't give a a crap about the Mariners at all. Here's something that is interesting. Whether you are a football fan, a basketball fan, a Formula One fan, a baseball fan, whatever, whatever got you here today. I think honestly, my mother would be entertained by this video. Look up John Boy. Everyone knows John Boy if you're a baseball fan. John Boy breaking down the Mariners and the Angels fight the other day. They had a brawl. And it was, oh my goodness, I watched that this morning with my buddy Sean. What a hilarious, hilarious video. And uh, I can't recommend that enough. Go look up, like I said, John Boy, J-O-M-B-O-Y. John Boy, Angels, Mariners, fight breakdown. You're going to see one of the most funny YouTube videos you've seen in a while. Very entertaining, very fun. Whether you like baseball or not, that's a great watch. And, uh... Dude, John Boy is doing the Lord's work. I love that guy so much. We've talked behind the scenes. Jimmy O'Brien is awesome. And uh, man, I just, uh, nothing but love for that. Okay, here's a, a quote that I like. John Middlecoff put this on Instagram. John Middlecoff, I think works with Colin Cowherd in, in some capacity. I don't know. He's a former scout. He actually does a lot of good work. I like what he says. But um, John Middlecoff put on, he put this on Instagram. It's a, it's a screenshot of, and a screenshot of himself. So it's like a double screenshot and then I screenshot it. It's so like a screenshot within a screenshot within a screenshot. Like a screenception, I don't know. But it's the Seahawks have reportedly discussed trading for Jimmy Garoppolo is the Sports Illustrated article that got posted. And John Middlecoff said this on Twitter and then put it on Instagram, which again, it's screenshot within a screenshot. He said, my favorite reports are Team X has done their film evals on Player X if he becomes available. What do you think scouting departments do? Write up Netflix shows? study the crypto market. Every scouting department in the NFL had Jimmy graded four or five months ago. That is their job. So this is what he put on Instagram. Well, I get it. People like it. He's saying, I get why this kind of article gets put out there that, hey, the Seahawks apparently did research on trading for Jimmy Garoppolo. He says, I get it. People like seeing this stuff. Some of these stories sound way crazier than they are. Every team discusses every trade or signing. That's their job. That's what they do. Jimmy Buffett talks about investing at the office. Elon talks about space and suing Twitter. NFL GMs ask every day, should we sign or trade for this guy? It's what they do. So I love John Middlecoff. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you for calling it like it is. Yeah, like I I get it's interesting. People go, oh, the Seahawks might get the 49ers quarterback, but that's, you're making something out of nothing. It's a mountain out of a molehill. Um, every, Every scouting department in the world Talks about making a move for a guy and does evals and 
you know, you go to work every day and do whatever you do. I go to work every day. I make videos and podcasts. They go to work every day and make up reports on a player. How good is this guy? Should we trade him? What is he worth to us? And that that's kind of a, sounds like a fun job, by the way, making film analysis basically um, for NFL teams. Uh, but that that idea is uh, I, I really I don't know. It, it's just it's totally overblown when you see stories like that. And I really appreciate it. John Middlecoff calling it like it is. He actually put me on his Instagram story. Pretty cool. I think I got more followers than the guy. Hey, that's that's amazing. I got more followers on Instagram than John Middlecoff. How did that happen? Well, OK, hell yeah. I love it. Um, here's the story of the week. I absolutely freaking lutely love, love, love this story. This is one uh, made me laugh, made me cry, gave me a lot of oh, a lot of good times and feelings all around. We'll start with a screenshot. Um, <laughs> NFL memes. We'll explain what this means in a moment. Zach Wilson getting ready for his mom's book club. And it's him in a... It's Zach Wilson with a nice suit on looking in the mirror like kind of debonair. And the, the caption says, Zach Wilson throwing bombs and effing moms. <laughs> so if you don't know, uh, Zach Wilson's ex accused him of sleeping with his mom's best friend. They broke up. She's actually dating now Dax Milne, the former BYU receiver who plays for Washington. It's fun drama. Zach Wilson dumped her. They broke up or something. She's now dating his former roommate and wide receiver. She got called a homie hopper. And then she was like, well, Zach Wilson had a relationship with his mom's best friend. And um, I don't know. None of that's good, really, necessarily. It is kind of funny that the the Mormon guys, they like refuse to touch caffeine but they'll do stuff like that i don't know that's pretty funny to me but as a fan of older women me zach shomler like one of my last relationships in hawaii was with a <laughs> dare i say this i gotta i gotta one of my most recent we'll call it a relationship was with a 48 year old ballet teacher right like I, i'm all for the older women i love that and uh, this story made me laugh really really hard and uh I don't know, man. It's pretty funny. And there's a great quote. Uh, so Zach Wilson got accused of cheating with his mom's best friend. And he's got a, qu- a, a tweet out there because he played for the BYU Cougars, which is even more hilarious. And he's like, Cougar Nation, all in all caps. And uh, <laughs> someone put it out there. This did not age well for Zach Wilson. <laughs> it's one of my favorite stories in a long time. I uh, I recently started dating again. And I told my parents like, hey, just so you know, the next one's going to be like 10 years older than me. I just that's. That's who, that's my age range. I just is what it is, and I'm gonna bring one home event finally. And uh, I don't know this whole the Zach Wilson. It could be not even true. Like let's let's acknowledge it's a rumor. Maybe it didn't happen. Although his mom appears to be accidentally confirming it over and over again on social media. By the way, Zach Wilson's mother is a, a train wreck of a woman. I cannot believe if I was him, I'd be like, Mom, shut the hell up. You you are making me look bad by posting all this crap on social media, please stop talking. And it'll be interesting as the world continues to, um, I guess as athletes get younger and younger, or as I get older, maybe as the world goes on, whatever that means, we're seeing athletes that grew up with social media now in pro sports and also their parents have social media more and more and more. And so like 10 years from now, it'll be our my generation having kids and their kids starting to become no- notorious in, in pro sports and whatever. And um, it'll be really, really interesting when, like, my generation's kids are in the NFL. And they've had social media for years. And you're like, can you believe what blah, blah, blah's mom said? It's like, yeah, she's had Instagram since she was in seventh grade. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's, it's a hilarious thing to think about. But it does appear like Zach Wilson actually did sleep with his mom's best friend. Is that my business? Is that the sports world's business? Is that even worth talking about on a sports podcast? I, I think it's funny, so I, I'm all for it. <laughs> um, here's The next screenshot is about... Um, oh, wait, we got one more on the Zach Wilson thing, actually. Uh, NFL memes put this out there. They also made a pretty clever tight end joke. They said, if the Zach Wilson rumors are true, it'll be the first time the Jets have scored over 40 since 2018. <laughs> <laughs> yes! I love it. It's so funny to me. The, the Zach Wilson story just made my heart smile. I, I Just because just it's funny. It's very humorous. And uh, you don't see a lot of those stories running around out there. And I, I kind of, I honestly think this one's probably true. And that's even more funny. Um, is, is cheating good? No, but I don't I don't know. It's a, it's a disaster. But I'm going to try to find entertainment where I can. Uh, it's the offseason. I got nothing else to talk about. 
Um, CBS Sports put this on Instagram. The longest streak of consecutive games with a passing touchdown. Kirk Cousins holds that right now. He's got 30 games in a row with a passing touchdown, followed by Matthew Stafford, 22 games, Justin Herbert, 21 games, and Patrick Mahomes and Dak Prescott both have eight. That's including the postseason, by the way. Um, Kirk Cousins, 30 straight games in a row with a passing touchdown. Here's what I want to say about this. It's a a jumping off point to talk about the Vikings. Um, They're getting Kevin O'Connell, a new offensive-minded head coach. You got Dalvin Cook, an awesome running back. Two stud receivers, Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson. And I don't know that Kirk Cousins has ever really been fully unleashed in his career. I'm excited here. I I think there is a lot of potential here for Kirk Cousins to turn some heads and surprise a lot of people. And the Vikings offense, I I think, could be really, really potent this fall. And uh, so much so that if the Packers falter a little bit, if it takes a while for Aaron Rodgers to get used to not having Devontae Adams, he's got that young running back, Christian Watson, if it takes them a while to get going, if the Packers have a slow start and the Vikings can take off early with a high-powered offense, it's possible the Vikings win that division. Like, it's it's not out of the realm of possibility, and I am personally very, very, very excited about watching Kirk Cousins and the Vikings offense this fall. How about this for a crazy number? Uh, NFL Research put this out there. In Justin Herbert's first two years in the NFL, he's got 9,350 passing yards. That's the most in NFL history. He's got 69 nice passing touchdowns. That's the most in NFL history in your first two years. And he's got 17 300 uh, or more passing yard games. That's the most in NFL history. Not only was I monumentally wrong about Justin Herbert, but I love seeing the guy do very, very well. It's fun to talk about. It's fun to acknowledge. And um, as you think about the top five quarterbacks in the NFL right now, I would go, this is me spitballing, Rodgers in the conversation, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, and Justin Herbert's got to be in that in that conversation. And to do what he's done as quickly as he has and as well as he has is so cool. And really what I'm excited about is that he, I think, could be the greatest quarterback the Chargers have ever had in their entire franchise. And uh, I'm just really excited for his future. I'm excited to watch him do well. I think the Chargers are a... Dark Horse playoff team, or sorry, let me back up. Yes, a playoff team. I think a Dark Horse Super Bowl team. And uh, I don't know. Like, here's a fun Super Bowl that would surprise a lot of people. <laughs> this is going to sound insane. I I apologize in advance. Uh, LA versus Minnesota. Justin Herbert against Kirk Cousins. Two high powered offenses. I think the thing that people are forgetting is how good that the Chargers defense is. And, uh, Justin Herbert, man, is just incredible. And I think a lot of people are, to me, they're my favorite to win that division, the AFC West. It's going to be a bloodbath. No one really knows what's going to happen. But a lot of eyes are on Denver or Kansas City. A lot of people are overlooking LA. And I think that, man, the Chargers are just going to be a force to be reckoned with this fall. And I'm very, very hopeful and excited to watch them. All right. uh, Last one today. We got to give... Is there? Do I have another person? I, okay, uh, I almost I almost talked about your man Adam Schefter. I, I like I like if I'm going to share a screenshot, I want to uplift someone else if I can. I don't know how to say this last name. Ari Myrov at more, my sports update on Twitter said that the Texans have unveiled a new battle red helmet that will be worn during the 2022 season. They will wear this helmet when they play the Eagles in week nine on Thursday night football. Um, a friend of mine sent me a text. He said, <laughs> you might know some people who are Texans fans. Uh, he said, I'm, as a Texans fan, we're doing all this hoopla just to lose to the Eagles 37 to three. <laughs> I was like, that's pretty good and pretty funny. But I, I love this stuff. I got to say, like I talk as often as I can. This battle red helmet, you know, it's Houston's, this is odd but true, by the way, Houston's new battle red helmet will mark the first time Houston has worn a helmet other than their traditional blue look ever. They're getting an alternate helmet for the first time. I like seeing, I want more and more teams to do this. Alternate helmets, alternate uniforms. I, the more we can make this happen, the better. I really, really like this. And uh, 
I, I say it almost every week, like the more variety you get, it, sports are entertainment. I want to see cool stuff, flashy stuff and fun stuff. And uh, the more we can do that kind of stuff in the sports world, the better. And I just, uh, especially football, man, like I watch football to be entertained. I want crazy jerseys, cool helmets. I want fun stuff. And I want more and more of that kind of thing to go on throughout the NFL. All right, it's time for an update. Um, by the way, I'm on a hill. I think I didn't realize until I started recording how much I'm a little bit like sloped. Like I'm, my camera is up the hill from me, and it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm not used to being uh, on a, a down slope while recording the podcast. I've, I've done, I've pretty much found a way to be in flat ground every time, except for today. Today, we're I'm parked in some dirt in a forest, basically. And I think it's beautiful. I, I hope it's a good background. It's much darker and not hopefully not as blown out as in the past. But uh, I don't know. Let's share something. Um, it's time for an update. And I, I think those of you who watch on YouTube can tell I'm in my pickup truck, the podcasting pickup. And obviously, I've made a bunch of changes to my life. I moved from Hawaii. Here we are recording the pickup truck. Uh, I'm still waiting on my canopy. There's a canopy that's going to be on the back of my truck at some point. I ordered it over a month ago, and it's still still shipping. I don't know when it's going to get here. Um, once we have that, let's be clear, I'm going to live out of the back of my truck and drive around and basically um, truck camp full time. And I'm going to drive around and do podcasts on the road. And I'm, I'm very excited for this change. And I, in case anyone missed it, I see a lot of comments that are like, did I miss something? Why is he in a truck? Totally get it. Um, this is my new office and I am still figuring it out. I'm still tweaking things. And again, we'll get a canopy soon. I got some tint I'm putting on the window very soon. Um, I built a desk I'm recording on. I built drawers in the back of my truck. I've got, I've got a whole, I, I've really done a lot of changes and invested a lot in making my truck really cool. Put solar on top at some point. And, uh, I, I'm excited about this, man, but I want to, I want to give you permission if, the changes, like if you can't handle the new recording setup, that's totally fine. I want to say thank you for listening. Uh, if this is your last time ever listening to this podcast, um, thank you for so much. You got me here to this point, and I, I'm very happy with my life, and uh, I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. So if, if you're uncomfortable with, with what changes are happening, I give you permission to, to walk away, and I just say thank you so much for uh, however long you follow. A lot of people have been here for years, and I'm really grateful. And... Uh, to those of you, of you sticking around, it's going to be an adventure. Every episode is going to be in a different location, and we're going to be driving around and at some point, I think, interviewing people. But I uh, I did an episode of my podcast. I've got a second podcast. We're 25 episodes in called Zach Shomler Talking. And on episode 23, I did a topic called Heavy. I'll leave a link to that in the description and in the comments. But I talked in great length and explained why I made the life changes that I made. Uh, and it, you know, for you, the short version is that I, I'm caring for myself. Like this is me doing something for me. I want to live out of my truck. I want to drive around. I want it, have a change of scenery and not be locked into a little office that felt claustrophobic at times. And, um, I'm going to call this strong opinion sports 2.0. Now, the good news is, uh, here's what I really like about this, is that you never need to worry about me covering news late ever again, because I, I am changing the way I talk about stuff. Here's the biggest change. I'm going to record, the, the official wordage I'm going to say is at least one episode a week. Um, so for you, the listener or the viewer, you can expect one episode a week at minimum. Uh, the reality is I will do bonus episodes where like, hey, I, I record on a Tuesday and I'm like, I got more to say. I'll record more on a Friday. But I'm going to call those bonus episodes. I'm only ever going to promise one episode of Strong Opinion Sports a week from here on out. And uh, so, hey, if news breaks on Friday and I don't record till Tuesday, I said, hey, I got one a week. I already did one a week. I'll, I'll get you next Tuesday and you'll get there. So this is a total change for me. I'm, I'm caring for myself. I'm doing something fun, I, something I'm excited about. And uh, Strong Opinion Sports 2.0, baby. We're doing out of the truck. We're on the road. We're having adventures and... Um, I think it's good for the podcast. Frankly, I think the audio sounds better than ever. Um, I think this background is much more interesting than some curtain in a dark studio room 
literally could be anywhere. Um, and, and I'm excited for the journey up ahead. I, I will, I guess I'll use this to promote my other stuff I'm working on. At some point, once I get the canopy and I'm officially, I mean, I'm, I'm staying somewhere right now, but once I get the canopy and I'm living out of the truck, we'll do vlogs on the road about what it's like to live in a pickup truck. And uh, I also got my other podcast, Zach Schaumler Talking, but um, yeah, I, I just, I had to make changes in my life to care for myself. And uh, that's what this is. We'll call it Strong Opinion Sports 2.0. And it, we're, we're done like a month worth of content out of the truck, but this is my official announcement finally. I wanted to wait till I got the canopy. I called the canopy people last night. They're like, yeah, your truck topper is like another couple weeks away. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So um, I'm like, I'm just, gonna, I'm not going to wait anymore to announce it. I'm going to put it out now. I wanted to make a breakout for people to hear that. So you can go to YouTube and see like a little four minute video of me explaining what I'm doing. But that is what I'm doing. I'm excited about it. And if you're curious why I'm in a truck, it's because pretty soon after putting lots of work into it, I'm going to move into this bad boy and drive around and do shows on the road, which sounds monumentally fun to me. And uh, like I said, if that doesn't sound fun to you and you don't want any part of that, no problem. I give you permission to leave. I, I appreciate uh, whatever support you might have given me in the past. You got me to this point. I'm very happy. Uh, also, you know, everyone says to ignore mean comments and they just weigh on me. Like mean comments are really hard for me because I'm a, I'm a real person. Like, believe it or not, uh, I'm a real guy who does the best I can. Uh, I, I've struggled with mental health before. And so I'm going to start having fun with it. I'm going to read mean comments on my other podcast, Zach Schaumler talking. I'll highlight one to three comments a week. And so let me say to the people out there who hate watch, hell yeah, thank you for watching. Uh, it actually does help me whether you like what I'm doing or not. When you watch, when you leave a comment, it does actually drive more traffic to the podcast. It helped me out. Um, and now if you want to say mean stuff, you get a reward. I'm going to feature you on my other show. And uh, that's it. This is the new setup. At least one episode a week. Uh, don't expect more, but expect one episode a week. And sometimes I'll give you what I'll call bonus episodes. And we'll do, I can see myself doing like three episodes a week. I mean, I really, I think I have a lot to say during football season, especially. Um, but I'm, I'm making changes to care for myself and enjoy my life. And uh, certainly I'm doing that. So this is uh, Strong Opinion Sports 2.0. All right. Hey, we did it. We got that announcement out of the way. It's been like a month in the works. I, I really wanted to wait till I got the new canopy, but it's just, they say supply chain. I don't know what the heck. I mean, I do drive a, a very unique truck that not every, I drive a GMC Canyon with four doors and an extended bed, which is pretty rare to have that kind of truck. They don't make very many. So finding a canopy that fits that is kind of weird. It's actually kind of a small truck given how much is going on here. So um, but I wanted, a, I didn't want an F-350. I wanted like a smaller, more versatile truck that could actually park. And here we are with this weird mishmash of fun stuff. So, uh, yeah. Now it's time to read some questions from the audience. If you want to submit questions on Patreon, you go to patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler, patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler. You can donate a dollar a month. Please do. It literally does uh, pay for me to exist. Uh, you can donate more if you want to. That, you know, $5 a month is an option, 10 whatever you want. Uh, whatever you donate really helps. But for the minimum is a dollar a month. You get access to submit questions on Patreon. You also, by the way, get to submit questions to my other podcast, Zach Schaumler Talking. You also get that podcast early on Patreon. So I'll try to give you a bang for your buckets, $12 a year, a dollar a month. That's pretty good. And, uh... Yeah, patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler. You can write in as Balin did. Let me pull it up. Uh, Balin writes in and says, here's a dumb question. Of course, the food is basically the same in both places, but what do you enjoy more? Food, food while watching football, either at the game or at home, or food while watching baseball, either at home or at the game. So what is more enjoyable, watching football or baseball with food? Uh, I, you know, you, there's a lot of variables here. If I'm at home, I, I'd rather watch football with food cause I can spread out. Uh, it's, I can make nachos, whatever I can eat with. A, I, when I watch football, I take notes like very heavily, which means I don't want to have finger food and I eat finger food with a fork. Like I eat pizza with a fork while I'm watching football. I know that makes me sound like an insane person, but you don't want to get grease and stuff all over your pen and paper while you're taking notes. So you use, so if I'm at home, football and good food. Hell yeah, I love it. I love 
the Super Bowl with my dad, it's usually like me, my dad, and like one other person. It's a very small Super Bowl party. It's very quiet. It's low-key. My stepmom makes amazing food. And we like just to have a very low-key, relaxed time. That's my ideal football watching party. Good food and football. But if I'm out at a game, I want to watch baseball at the ballpark with a hot dog and a beer. That sounds... Baseball game food hits different, in my opinion. Um, baseball is much more about the environment. You get the hot dog, you get the beer, you're with your friends, you're relaxing, you're flirting with some girls, you're doing whatever. Uh, and the food adds to that experience where when I'm at a football game, the food doesn't add to the atmosphere as much as it does to the baseball game. So I'll say this. If I'm at a game with food, I want it to be baseball. If I'm at home watching good food with football, that's the way to do it. So I think they're... Football and baseball are just different. They just hit different. They're they're different styles and um, they each have their own strength and weakness. But I've been watching a lot more baseball recently. I'm really enjoying, um, like I said, I'm living right now with a guy who's a huge Mariners fan. And that has been, he's sucking me back in. I'm really, I'm enjoying watching the Mariners for the first time in my entire life. And, uh, and we're going to go up to a game at some point and uh, have some food and enjoy a really expensive hot dog and an expensive couple beers and probably ride the train back and just enjoy. Um, I want to get drunk at a baseball game. Like that sounds really fun to me. Like I, I'm all in on that. And uh, I don't know. That's, that's my answer. Uh, Balin Harrison writes in. Oh, what? It's not loading. Give me a second. I want to go. I want to go track down to Harrison's question on Patreon. Harrison had an interesting one. I thought, but I, I copied it wrong. So, that's on me. That's my fault. Sorry, Harrison. We're going to do you justice. Harrison writes in and he says, Good day, Zach. I hope you're enjoying your adventure so far. The truck setup looks good. Thank you, Harrison. I was wondering which college quarterbacks were on your radar outside of CJ Stroud and Bryce Young for the 2022 college football season. For me, I want to watch Will Levis at Kentucky and Caleb Williams at USC. Speaking of USC, do you think they can make some noise this season? Their offense looks intriguing with transfers running backs, which transfers running back Travis Dye from Oregon and Jordan Addison from Pitt. Number one wide receiver in college football, in my opinion, forming a nice duo for Caleb Williams. Keep up the great content and safe travels. P.S. If you ever decide to holiday down in Australia at any point in the future, you've got yourself a room at my place for as long as you want. But also be keen to show you that an Aussie can spin the pigskin as well. Harrison. Harrison, you live in Australia and you like American football. You maniac. I love it. Um, I might just take you up on that. I'll go to Australia. I got invited. There's a woman who wants me to come. I shouldn't say that out loud. Um, <laughs> I got a friend in Australia who wants me to come visit her. And uh, I might do that. So if I ever am in Australia, Harrison, I'll hit you up. Uh, God, that was the most douche thing I could have ever said. I didn't mean to I didn't mean to frame it that way. I'm so sorry. I met her on Tinder. She, I was in Hawaii. We hung out once. And she's like, I live in Australia. Come visit me. And I, may, maybe someday. I don't know. We'll see if I'm even single in that future. Um, Jesus, shut up, Zach. Stop talking about your life. Um, let me first, I somehow missed the Travis die transfer to Oregon until I read this couple, you know, a couple days ago and you posted it on Patreon. I'm like, Travis die went to USC. That's unbelievable. So good for him. Um, here are the college quarterbacks. I'm excited to watch this fall. Keaton Slovis at Pittsburgh is going to be awesome. Cannot wait for him. Uh, I think Keaton Slovis got kind of a Kind of a raw deal with what happened at USC. He got hurt. He lost his job. They got a new coach, whatever. He went somewhere where he was wanted, where they got a good offensive line, a good team around him. And I'm excited to watch Keaton Slovis at Pittsburgh a lot. You mentioned it. I'll repeat him. Uh, CJ Stroud at Ohio State is going to be awesome. Bryce Young at Alabama. Caleb Williams at USC for sure. I think he's the best quarterback in college football, frankly. Uh, Will Levis at Kentucky. Um, sure. It's funny. Both quarterbacks from Oklahoma last year went to a version of USC. Uh, you know, Caleb Williams went to Southern California and Spencer Rattler went to the other USC, South Carolina. I cannot wait to watch Spencer Rattler play at South Carolina. Like him against SEC competition is going to be fascinating. I cannot wait to watch that. Uh, you also got Sam Hartman at Wake Forest. He's good and fun. And I, I mean, I don't mean to no homo here, but Sam Hartman's got to be like the most attractive quarterback in college football. If there was an award for that, that, that guy, he would win it. Uh, then you got Dylan Gabriel at Oklahoma. Tyler Van Dyke at Miami. Got some possibilities here I'm excited to watch. Um, J.J. McCarthy at Michigan is really interesting. I think he could beat out Cade McNamara. 
Uh, Clemson's going to have either DJ Uwe Ungale or Cade Klubnick be their starting quarterback. That'll be interesting. I think Jackson Dart's going to start at Ole Miss. Uh, Texas got Quinn Ewers coming from Ohio State transferring in. I'm excited, man. I Football in general this year is going to be unbelievable. The NFL is going to be, I think, an all-time year. And college football has so many storylines and quarterbacks and moves. And apparently colleges can enter the transfer portal now. Like, I cannot wait at all to watch football this fall. It's going to be really fun. And we're only like a month and a half out. Like, I... Gosh, man, I cannot wait for football season. It's going to be unbelievable. And, uh, oh, man, it's it's kind of overwhelming how much good football there's going to be going on this fall. By the way, that gives me an opportunity to say this. I want to, I don't, I didn't know when to throw this into the episode, but it's not in my notes. I wanted to put it in there today, though. Here's a move I would consider if I was a Pac-12. Whatever is left of the Pac-12, because UCLA and USC left, uh, I, I read a report that Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, and Colorado are thinking of going to the Big 12. And Oregon, you know, Phil Knight, their biggest owner, the owner of Nike, wants to... um, He really wants Oregon to go to the SEC. If they can't do that, they'll take the Big 10. Um, So, like, they they want out. uh, You're seeing the Pac-12 kind of crumble. And I think if I got friends at Washington State, a lot of... I live in the Northwest, so there's Washington, Washington State, Oregon State... Cal, Stanford, like what's going to happen to these colleges that are left now in with whatever is the Pac-12? Can You know what I would do right now today if I were them? I would say, here's one possibility. If I was the schools remaining, I'd say, hey, Pac-12 offices, screw you guys. We're doing our own thing. And we're going to have the our own, we'll change our name if we need to. But I, I'd be like, I'm not listening to the Pac-12 office anymore. I'm going to negotiate on my own and make sure that we're okay. Because if you're Washington State, you don't want to be odd man out. You're like, we got to make moves now. If George Klavkov can't make something happen, then we, we got to advocate for ourselves. And I'd be like, the same way I've heard college football threaten to be like, we'll just do football without the NCAA's approval. Could you have a conference and just get rid of the people running things at the top? Because I don't know that the Pac-12 is very well run. They've got this expensive office in San Francisco that's been nothing but a money pit, especially given what happened with the Rona. Um, so that's one possibility. Here's, if I were the Pac-12, though, if I were George Klavkoff, I'm the guy running the Pac-12, the commissioner. Are we not? Uh, one second. There we go. Whew. Battery almost died. Your boy Zach's an idiot. I keep forgetting to... So my, my battery recording the, the podcast, I might cut this out. You got to turn on the AC adapter. I always plug it in and then forget to turn it on. So my battery, my camera runs off the battery and goes, we're dying. Ah, okay. Anyway, if I'm George Clay, Klavkoff, if I'm the guy running the Pac-12, I'm the Pac-12 commissioner. I would pursue the University of Hawaii and BYU. BYU is a Really, really good idea if you are a Power 5 conference, in my opinion. Because, um, let's be clear first. If you're the Pac-12, you got it. You got to let go of your stuffiness and your academic rigor and all this nonsense. And yeah, you got to deal with the Mormon stuff. But screw all that. BYU has a massive, massive, massive fan base. The Mormon population loves BYU. And uh, I don't know if I'm speaking off like, you know, out out of pocket here. They tend to have money too. Like they're they're a fan base that buys gear, will spend money on your stuff. They're going to come to bowl games. They're going to show up and support the program. If you elevate BYU to a, a Power Five conference, you're bringing in a lot of new people that have interest and and come along with that football team. And I I just think, man, the money's too good. I, I I'll deal with the Mormonism stuff. I'll deal with whatever I need to do to make that happen. Because you, if you're the Pac-12 and you're desperate to save your conference. Bring in BYU. That's too good of an opportunity as far as marketing, as far as how big their fan base is. Um, And then I look at Hawaii as one of the biggest potential opportunities in college football. Think of how many really good football players grow up in Hawaii and they leave. I used to live in Hawaii. I've seen how many. It's unbelievable how many good athletes come out of Hawaii. But they don't stay in Hawaii because there isn't, there is not a top college football program in the state the the university of hawaii at manoa that football program it doesn't have enough money and is a mountain west school but if you put hawaii in the pac-12 elevate them to make them big time college football and inject them with money which a new tv deal would do if hawaii had good facilities better uniforms and more money 
People might stay in Hawaii. These All these athletes, Tua Tungavaloa went to Alabama. Uh, Monte Teo went to Notre Dame. There's so many. Every year, there are so many football players from the state of Hawaii that leave the state because there isn't a program that represents what they want to do in college. Some guys are always going to want to leave because they want to get out of the, they want to get away from the island. But a lot of guys would stay near their family if they could, but they want to play high level college football and have a shot at the NFL. And right now, UH Manoa doesn't do that. If you elevate Hawaii's football program, put them in the Pac-12, make them big time college football, then inject some money, give them new facilities, give them new uniforms, make it more attractive to play for them, you're going to get some of that talent. The same way the U of Miami in the uh, Snellenberger era, the, God, what's the name? Jimmy Johnson era. They dominated recruiting in Miami. If you can dominate recruiting in Hawaii as Hawaii and keep guys locally, you'd have a really dang good football program. But right now, most Division I football players leave Hawaii because the program isn't good enough to keep them in their hometown or in their home state. So, um... If I'm the Pac-12, I'm pursuing BYU. They got a big fan base with money that will come to bowl games and love to show up and celebrate BYU football. And Hawaii, it's actually similar. They got a lot of people from Hawaii all over the country that they love rooting for anything Hawaii. People feel connected to Hawaii. They want to cheer for that school and anything to do with that state. Whether they live in Connecticut or Maine or Minnesota, wherever, they see Hawaii football doing well. They're turning it on. They love Hawaii. Also, Man, if you inject some money into the Hawaii football program, the potential is there to become a power in college football, in my opinion. Plus, also, you can sell it in recruiting. Hey, if you join our conference, you get to go to Hawaii twice in four years. Two road games, your career in Hawaii. That's also a good deal. So uh, if I'm the Pac-12, I am pursuing BYU football and Pac-12 football in a heartbeat. I think I'd be really smart. And uh, I'm surprised that I'm not seeing more of that conversation out there, but... That's a move that I would do if I was George Klavkoff, the commissioner of the Pac-12. I think it might help save their conference, and uh, that's what I would do. Okay, Samuel writes in on Patreon. Samuel has a beautiful story. He says, okay, Zach, got a bit of a story for you. For context, I just recently started working at a restaurant in Athens, Ohio, which, if you didn't know, is Joe Burrow's hometown. Yesterday, we had a small catering in one of our private rooms for a party of about 20 And none of the employees were told anything other than that. So after we have everything set up and we all but forget about the event upstairs and are just working through an absolutely brutal dinner rush, my manager comes into the kitchen and tells me he's got someone for me to meet. So we head upstairs and our private event was Joe Burrow hosting some of his high school coaches and teammates so they could hang out and talk about life. Anyway, Joe took the time to shake my hand and get a picture with me and ask me about my day even though... I was just some employee from the restaurant that happened to be he happened to be at. Obviously, I don't know him on a personal level, but that interaction just reinforced what I already believed that Joe is just a stand-up guy from a small town and hasn't let the fame of being one of the NFL's best go to his head. And now he officially has me a hardcore Browns fan rooting for him. Anyway, sorry for the long post. Hope everything is well as always, Sam. That's so cool. You're a Browns fan who got ingratiated by the Bengals quarterback, the other team uh, in your state. That's a cool Joe Burrow story, man. Joe Burrow is my favorite quarterback in the NFL. The minute Tom Brady retires, I'm going to shift all that love to Joe Burrow. I love him. I love Joey B so much. And uh, two two guys, I got, you know, that's, that's I read that on my other podcast, Zach Schaumler talking. He actually wrote into it there, but I want to read it on both because it's so interesting. And uh, right now, two quarterbacks that I think, Don't quite get all the love they should. Maybe three. We'll say Josh Allen for sure. But also, Joe Burrow deserves more love and respect than he gets. And then Justin Herbert, man. Small town guy who's got a ton of humility. Really nice dude. Uh, I I know some people that know Justin Herbert. And they just absolutely love the guy. And so, um, I think that story would be echoed by anyone who's interacted with all three of those people. Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, and Justin Herbert. Probably more than that too, but... Those are the couple I've got a deeper um, tendril connection to. So uh, that's pretty cool, man. Samuel, thanks for writing in. I love that. And uh, really, really cool stuff. All right, guys. Uh, We are 51 minutes into the podcast, maybe a little less, depending on editing. Um, If you're not a Formula One fan, you can absolutely leave right now. we got two topics left today. They're both about Formula One. But if you're a Formula One fan... 
What's up, Caleb? You're going to have the time of your life. I'm going to talk about Formula One now for two topics in a row. Let's start here. On Sunday, we had the Austrian Grand Prix at the Red Bull Ring. Uh, By the way, beautiful location for a race. Uh, The valley, the mountains all around. It is gorgeous. Now, here are the results from the race. On the podium, Charles Leclerc won for Ferrari. Second was Red Bull driver Max Verstappen. And third was Lewis Hamilton for Mercedes. Uh, Fourth was the other Mercedes, George Russell. Fifth was Esteban Ocon for Alpine. Sixth was Mick Schumacher, the best finish of his career so far for Haas, but also the best of his career so far, period. Uh, Seventh is Lando Norris with McLaren. Eighth was the other Haas, Kevin Magnussen. Ninth was the other McLaren, Daniel Ricciardo. And tenth uh, was Fernando Alonso for Alpine. That is double points for Mercedes, Alpine, McLaren, and Haas. By the way, there's like a military plane flying it over my head. I'm going to, I guess it's just going to happen. I don't know. You'd think like they they fly and then they're gone, but it's just going and going and going. Listen to this. You can hear that. I would think you guys could hear that. Like, unbelievably loud. Are you kidding me? Like, man. All right. uh, Shout out to Haas. They put a car in sixth and eighth. It's a huge thing for them. That team, Haas has come such a long way. And to see them competitive, but also not only competitive, but, you know, Mick Schumacher got driver of the day. And seeing him do well, like he's just starting to show that he's not just the son of a legend. He actually has some driving talent as well. Remember, his dad is Michael Schumacher, the seven-time world champion. Um, I I like seeing Haas get double points. That's really cool for them. And uh, I I like seeing Haas do well. By the way, that story, Kevin Magnuson was not even supposed to drive this year. Russia invades Ukraine. They drop, uh, I already forgot the name of that, Maze of Spin. So seeing Kevin Magnuson and Mick Schumacher do well is really cool. And I don't know that, in fact, I know for sure, uh, Mesa Spin, we'll call him, would not have done nearly as well as Kevin Magnuson is doing this year for Haas. And uh, you'll love to see it. Now, Mercedes had a roller coaster of a weekend that ended well for them, actually, somehow. Uh, Things started in qualification when both Lewis Hamilton and George Russell crashed during uh, Q3 of qualification and during the sprint race, Lewis Hamilton had a difficult time. He could barely pass Mick Schumacher. Uh, and so, and by the way, I'm not used to that, seeing a Mercedes and a Haas genuinely compete with each other. That was pretty jarring. So Lewis started the race on Sunday in eighth. And then on top of that, during the race, George Russell made contact with Sergio Perez and got a five-second time penalty. So a lot went wrong for Mercedes this weekend in Austria. Despite that, though, they got third and fourth. And to get third and fourth, given the weekend they had, is pretty cool. They got 27 points on the day on Sunday. That's more than any other team got. And uh, I would call it a good weekend for Mercedes, despite all the turbulence that led to that point. Now, the result for Sergio Perez uh, this weekend was very, very unfortunate for him. During sprint qualifying, he was brilliant. He went moved up eight places from 13th to 5th. I was like, man... Sergio Perez is on fire. It's awesome. Then during the race, during lap one, he got spun around by George Russell on lap one, got penalized. Uh, Russell got penalized, excuse me. But Sergio Perez had too much body damage to the car. And despite trying to continue, eventually on lap 26, Sergio Perez Checo had to retire the car. And uh, I, it's just, oh man, I, I, I think that Red Bull had potential for a lot more points this weekend, but that, that really cost him. And I, I even thought for a while that Checo was going to get back in the race. I'm like, well, he's way behind, but all he really needs is a safety car. And then he can move up through the pack if it, they can bring everything together. But he had too much body damage and lost a lot of time and just couldn't continue during the race. Now, for Ferrari, it was another weekend of pain. Uh, yes, Charles Leclerc won the race. Good for him. But they should have had a one-two finish. And I remember making a note around lap 45. I said... And by the way, this is word for word what I said in my notes. I said, Ferrari is the fastest car and should win. Podium will likely be 1-2 Ferrari with Max in third. So like I was writing it in now. I was like, man, it looks like Ferrari is going to get first and second in this race. However, what we saw was another Ferrari failure. On lap 57 of 71, Charles Leclerc was in first. Max Verstappen was in second. And Carlos Sainz, the other Ferrari, was in third. 
And Carlos had tires that were 13 laps newer, by the way, than Max Verstappen, who was ahead of him. And more pace. He's gaining ground. He's getting ready to pass him. And as Carlos Sainz is about to pass Max Verstappen for second place and basically secure a 1-2 finish, suddenly Carlos Sainz had engine failure and uh, Ferrari botched it again. It's like, are you kidding me? Ferrari had basically everything going right for them. And once again, the results slipped right through their hands. Carlos Sainz's car went from performing beautifully to suddenly it was rolling backwards down a hill on fire and the engine was blowing up damaging the side pod from the inside. It's horrifying and kind of scary, honestly, to think about driving a car with explosions happening right behind where you're sitting. So uh, despite having the two fastest cars on Sunday, what we saw was the fourth engine failure of the year for Ferrari. Cannot get a break from these planes, man. Oh my goodness. Uh, anyway, so all in all, uh, Carlos Sainz, Sergio Perez, and Nicholas Latifi had to all retire early and did not finish the race. Now, uh, one more fun storyline from Austria is this. Alpine and McLaren walk away from the Austrian Grand Prix tied. They both have 81 points. They're tied for uh, fourth in Formula One. We're halfway through the year, and to me that says a lot about the improvement Alpine has made. They've caught up to McLaren, and McLaren has not been as impressive as I thought. And I absolutely love Fernando Alonso. He's not perfect, but he's an old-school driver, very entertaining. I loved when he was wagging his finger at um, Yuki Tsunoda as he passed him, uh, as Alonso passed him in Austria. Um, also, Fernando Alonso once drove for McLaren, and you know he enjoys that they're tied and wants to beat them very, very badly. So uh, this this Alpine McLaren battle, I, I told you a couple weeks ago, it's it's really interesting and really fun. It keeps getting better and better and better, and I absolutely love it. Now here are the driver standings after this weekend in Austria. In first place in Formula One, you got Max Verstappen with 208 points. In second, you got Charles Leclerc with 170 points. In third, Sergio Perez with 151 points. Fourth is Ferrari driver Carlos Sainz with 133 points. In fifth, George Russell with 128 points. Ahead of his teammate, Lewis Hamilton, who's in sixth with 109 points. Here are the team standings or the constructors standings in Formula 1 so far, halfway through the year. In first, you got Red Bull with 359 points. In second is Ferrari with 303 points. Third is Mercedes behind them with uh, 237 points. In fourth is McLaren, tied with Alpine, who both have 81 points. In sixth is Alfa Romeo with 51 points. And uh, the next race is July 24th in France. We get a few weeks off between now and then, but um, the final 11 races of this F1 season are going to be really fun, really interesting. And uh, I'm curious, like, who do you think is going to win the world title this year? Ferrari, Red Bull, Max, Charles Leclerc. Um, and then really the, the battle I'm, I'm very fascinated on. A couple things. First of all, can Mercedes catch up to Ferrari? Ferrari keeps screwing up. Mercedes is in a position where they could eventually catch up to Ferrari. And then I think Alpine's a better team right now than McLaren. And I'm, I'm very fascinated on this battle for fourth. I think Alpine is probably going to finish ahead of McLaren. And I didn't see that at the beginning of the year. So they've gained pace. They've gotten better. McLaren has really fallen off. Daniel Ricciardo's a huge disappointment. And uh, let me know what you think of the final 11 races this year in Formula 1. What are you excited for? What do you think is going to happen? And who do you believe is going to win the world title? All right. Uh, let's acknowledge it. We are at the halfway point of the Formula 1 season. We're 11 races in. There are 11 more races to go. And I want to share the current standings and check in on my thoughts on how every team is doing so far in Formula 1. So here are the constructor standings, 11 races in. In first, you get Red Bull with 359 points. In second is Ferrari with 303 points. In third, Mercedes with 237 points. Then... Tied for fourth is, with 81 points, McLaren and Alpine. In sixth, you've got Alfa Romeo with 51 points. Seventh is Haas with 34 points. Eighth is Alfa Tauri with 27 points. Ninth is Aston Martin with 18 points. And 
dead last in 10th is Williams with, hey, they got a, a whopping three points in Formula One, which I'm not going to lie, is actually pretty good for them. Um, also, technically, uh, McLaren is fourth and Alpine is fifth because they were ahead going into the weekend. So if the year ended today, McLaren would be fourth and Alpine would be fifth. But we'll see as the year goes on. I, I think Alpine's got a great shot to beat McLaren for fourth and Formula One. I want to start off by, we'll check in with every team, but I want to start off by talking about Ferrari. Ferrari's in second place right now, 56 points behind Red Bull. And it's very, very disappointing because Ferrari should probably be leading Formula One right now. They've had engine failure four times this year. It's usually happened, by the way, when they have cars at the front in a podium position For example, in Spain, Charles Leclerc had a huge lead when, like, way ahead. I think lap 27, when suddenly his car lost power. He should have won and instead had to retire. Like, that should have been an easy victory for Charles Leclerc that got turned into a DNF, which is very sad. Lost, missed out on a bunch of points there. At Baku, again, Charles Leclerc had the lead and had to retire. In fact, Ferrari had a double DNF as both drivers had engine failure. In Austria, Ferrari... Should have had an easy one-two finish, but Carlos Sainz's engine literally blew up. So Ferrari over and over again keeps shooting themselves in the foot. And for Ferrari, it's been a year of missed opportunities and failure. And if Ferrari doesn't win the world title this year, it's going to be a really big what-if in the history of Formula 1, where you're going to go like, can you imagine them having the fastest car and all the potential and all the positioning and keep, they just can't get it together? I mean... They're failing to live up to their potential. They're 56 points behind Red Bull, and Charles Leclerc is 38 points behind Max Verstappen. It should be neck and neck, but Ferrari keeps shooting themselves in the foot, and oh, it's it's frustrating. Now, Red Bull right now leads Formula 1 with 359 points, and Max is first in the driver's standing. Sergio Perez is third. Red Bull keeps benefiting from Ferrari's failures. Uh, I think Red Bull has been... Feeling good, although I think slightly threatened, you know, at their home track in Austria, Ferrari straight up was faster. Like Ferrari, Charles Leclerc passed Max easily. Carlos Sainz should have passed Max easily. It is funny, though, how going into the year, everyone was calling Red Bull unreliable. And that's actually been more true of Ferrari so far. If I'm Red Bull, I'd be worried that Ferrari cleans things up and eventually uh, is going to dominate us because... While Red Bull leads Ferrari 359 to 303 with 11 races in, it's a 56-point lead. I'd be worried that the gap isn't enough because, you know, if Ferrari gets it together, they are going to win more races and, and could eventually dominate Red Bull. Now, one thing I will say, I say it time and time again, Sergio Perez, week in and week out, proves to be You know, that move, adding Sergio Perez to Red Bull's uh, stable of drivers uh, is just keeps proving itself to be an absolute triumph and and just a beautiful decision. He's a perfect driver to pair alongside Max Verstappen. He's talented. He can win. He's been on the podium. Sergio Perez, Checo's been on the podium six of 11 times this year. He won at Monaco. And he's got the humility uh, to listen to team orders and uh, put the team ahead of himself. Sergio Perez has become my favorite driver in Formula 1. I absolutely love the guy. Um, I love his story. I love that he was almost out of F1. He was driving, we used to call him Pepto Perez, driving the pink uh, Team Force India car and then whatever they were for a little bit, racing point or whatever. Um, He was almost out of F1. And for him to, he did well at the end of that stint with racing point. He kept his job uh, and now he's doing very well in the fast Red Bull car. I just absolutely love Checo. He's my favorite driver and uh, I love seeing the guy do well. How about Mercedes? I think given how bad this year has been for them, it's impressive where Mercedes is right now, 11 races into the form of the one season. Lewis Hamilton had a slow start to the year. He got 10th in Saudi Arabia, 13th in Italy, 6th in Miami, eighth in Monaco, like in recent years that I've watched Formula One, even Lewis Hamilton getting a sixth position is like almost unthinkable. You're like, it, Lewis got sixth? What happened? Did he blow a tire? Like how, how, what happened here? How is this possible? So 
for him to get sixth in a Lewis Hamilton driven Mercedes car, let alone 13th is out of character and out of, things are changing here. And Mercedes has had not as fast a car. They're struggling with porpoising. And also a weird thing about this year is that regularly Lewis has been outperformed or at least out, um, out positioned regularly where George Russell keeps finishing ahead of Lewis Hamilton. It's been very jarring and surprising. In fact, people were asking, is George Russell a better driver than Lewis Hamilton? Like, what's going on here? And now, in the last three races, things have turned around. Lewis Hamilton has been third three times in a row in Canada, Silverstone, and Austria. Uh, so things are getting better for Lewis Hamilton. And Mercedes, by the way, is in third right now with 237 points. Um, you know, McLaren is behind that. McLaren and Alpine are tied with 81 points. They're no threat to catch up to Mercedes from behind. But Ferrari, they're in second with 303 points. And with 11 races to go, Mercedes seems to be getting stronger. Ferrari, they keep struggling with engine failure. If Ferrari keeps faltering and Mercedes keeps getting better, there's a very, very small chance that Mercedes actually could catch Ferrari and beat them and get second in Formula 1, which would be crazy and surprising. Um, now, one thing that's been undeniable this year about Mercedes is that bringing on George Russell has been a really, really great move. He's done so well driving for Mercedes. He's been very, very consistent. He's fifth in the driver's standings with 128 points. He's 19 points ahead of Lewis, which is a big surprise going into the year. I would have not thought that. Uh, George has finished top five in 10 out of the 11 races this year. And the only time that George Russell hasn't finished in the top 10 or top five, excuse me, this year. The one time he didn't do that was when he crashed in the Joe Guan Yu incident at Silverstone. So he didn't even finish that race. Didn't have a real chance to get a top five finish. George has been an absolute stud on the podium five times, uh, three times, excuse me, on the podium three times, top five in every race he's finished. George Russell has been absolutely unbelievable. Now, a fun question to ask is this. Will Mercedes win any races this year? It's been Red Bull or Ferrari every single time this year. Uh, you know, the best Mercedes seems to be able to do is get third. And this is the longest Lewis Hamilton has ever gone without winning a race. It's now 12 races in a row that Lewis Hamilton hasn't won. That goes all the way back to Abu Dhabi last year in 2021. By the way, that's still an impressive stat. A lot of people would say, hey, if I won a race every 12 races, that's that's incredible. Like Most people will take that. Um, but Lewis, after dominating Formula One for years, I, I wonder, is, is Lewis going to go all of 2022 without a victory? Is, that's possible, and that would be a, a shock, given what I thought going into the year, that at least I knew Mercedes wasn't as fast, they are going to have a bad year, but I, I didn't think it'd be this bad. Um, so will Mercedes win it all this year? That's an interesting question to ponder because every victory so far has been Red Bull or Ferrari. And, uh, it doesn't look like without help, Mercedes is going to be able to win any race. They might be there if things go wrong in both teams, but that's four drivers that gotta have problems go wrong for them. And I, I don't think with, with pace alone, Mercedes can reasonably challenge Ferrari or Red Bull. And that, that's a thing that we haven't seen really in years. Now, McLaren right now is tied with Alpine for fourth with 81 points. McLaren is fine. Um, I guess I didn't expect that McLaren would push the big three, Red Bull, Ferrari, or Mercedes. Uh, but McLaren, I, I hope they take a step forward next year in Formula One because um, Daniel Ricciardo, while I love his personality, Danny Rick is awesome. He's been a huge disappointment for McLaren. His best finish this year is sixth. Uh, this is his second year with the team, and Danny Rick has been super underwhelming. He's currently 12th in the driver's standings with only 17 points, and I think Daniel Ricciardo's at risk of losing his spot. You're seeing a lot of PR and moves and stuff being put out by him and his team, but uh, I, I think McLaren is really thinking hard about, do we get rid of this guy? It's expensive, but Danny Rick is not performing where we need him to. Uh, now, Lando Norris is a stud and a talented driver. Uh, I think he's got potential to be one of the... Lando Norris is talented enough that with the right car, he could be world champion, in my opinion. But right now, uh, if McLaren wants to challenge a big three, 
in Formula One. They're probably going to need another and a better number two driver instead of Danny Rick. And they're going to need an even faster car. And uh, a lot of work to be done for McLaren if they want to get to the top of Formula One. But maybe they're happy where they are. I don't really know. Now, how about Alpine? Alpine is tied with McLaren with 81 points. And if they can finish fourth ahead of McLaren, that would be a huge victory for them. Also, their pairing of Fernando Alonso and Esteban Ocon is going really well. They're both competitive. They're both scoring points. Um, I, I'm enjoying it. I really, you know, Fernando Alonso is going to be 41 at the end of July. I, I don't know how much longer he plans to keep racing, but he's not really slowing down. And he is still competitive. And I'm here for it, man. I love, love, love watching Fernando Alonso race. And he's a tough old school guy that's hard to pass. He'll yell at you. But again, I think it's fun to watch. And uh, Fernando Alonso and Esteban Ocon, they're a great pairing right now. A French driver driving for a French team with Ocon. Fernando Alonso seems to be the driving force. They're kind of like Tom Cruise was with Top Gun Maverick. Like nothing goes on without his approval. And uh, I love it. Okay, Alfa Romeo, they're sixth right now in Formula One with 51 points. I find Alfa Romeo just kind of boring. They're, they're in the middle uh, they got a rookie, uh, Joe Guan Yu, who is finding his way in Formula One. Um, Valtteri Bottas has actually impressed me. He took a big step down going from a Mercedes car to an Alfa Romeo car. And yet he's still competitive. He actually, uh, he's had a couple good finishes. Fifth in Italy, seventh in Miami, sixth in Spain. Alfa Romeo, they're, they're a bit boring, but they are a decent team. Now Haas is seventh right now in Formula One with 34 points and... Man, Haas has been entertaining to watch. I uh, They've been bad for so long, and to see them get points and do well is, is pretty cool. And, you know, Kevin Magnussen has been competitive. Mick Schumacher, by the way, Kevin Magnussen wasn't even supposed to drive this year. Then, you know, Russia invades Ukraine, and uh, Mazepin, Nikita Mazepin, <laughs> Mazepin really loses his spot, and uh, they, they bring in... At the last minute, Kevin Magnuson, and he's done way better than Mazepin could have done, and very surprising. Well, it's really cool to see him do as well as he has. And um, Mick Schumacher is in year two of his F1 career, and he's finally starting to show that he's got some talent that isn't just the son of a a really famous dad. He's he, remember his dad is former seven time world champion Michael Schumacher. Some say his dad is the goat. A lot of pressure to live up to that, and, and you know at Silverstone. Mick got his first ever F1 points, and in Austria, he got six, his best ever F1 finish. To do that in a Haas car is impressive, and he's just getting better and better and better, and I hope someday he's on a top team with a great car. Uh, actually, Haas got double points two races in a row, which is pretty exciting, and you know my expectation for Haas has been so low for so long that I just like seeing them do well and get points. Like Good for Gunther and uh, Gunther Steiner, and uh, it's awesome. Alpha Tauri. They're a big fat, nah. You know, Alpha Tauri, they're in eighth right now with 27 points. Yuki Sonoda is young. He makes a lot of mistakes, one of their drivers. I'm curious if Pierre Gasly uh, might ever move up to another team. I-, I believe he's more talented than his car might show. And if Fernando Alonso ever retired from Alpine, maybe, you know, a-, a French guy like Pierre Gasly could go in and be with his home team. Or maybe he could replace Daniel Ricciardo with McLaren. I don't know, but... uh my buddy Caleb's a huge Alpha Tauri fan, and I just, I don't find Alpha Tauri very interesting, even if I've got a heart for and I like Pierre Gasly. And then Aston Martin, man. Aston Martin has been a huge disappointment. I thought that they might be more competitive. Uh, I thought they might be a more competitive midfield team, and they're ninth right now in Formula One with only 18 points. And, you know, the former team principal for Aston Martin, uh, Otmar Safnauer, he left to join Alpine, and Otmar won the breakup, man. He's doing great with Alpine. Aston Martin has been pretty bad this year. Their their car is terrible. I feel like Sebastian Vettel's career is being wasted. You got Lance and Lawrence Stroll, the billionaire, and his son, and that seems like a mess there. I wouldn't want to deal with. And I, I just wonder if Sebastian Vettel had a good car, uh, would he be a good driver? Would he be scoring a lot of points? Because the only time Sebastian Vettel makes news now is if he gives an interesting quote rather than stuff he's doing on the track. And that makes me sad because I think Seb is capable of more and we're just not seeing it. We'll never really know because we're not going to see him maybe ever again in a good car. And that's very, very sad. 
Now, Williams right now is 10th in Formula 1. They've got uh, three points. Their drivers are Alex Albon and Nicholas Satifi. They're, they're so uninteresting to me. Uh, the fact they have three points at all is very impressive, though. They did find something noteworthy to do, which is pretty cool. Alex Albon got 10th in Australia and 9th in Miami. That's three points right there. Um, but other than that, I got nothing else to say about Williams. Good good they got three points, I, more than I expected from them, and um, they found a way to get mentioned on the podcast. But I like, eh, I don't care about Williams. They're terrible. So let me know, uh, what team is you excited or disappointed so far during the 2022 F1 season? Um, who do you think is going to win the world title? I, I honestly, I, I have no idea. Probably, I would assume, <laughs> Max or Charles Leclerc, or Ferrari or Red Bull. But do you have a strong opinion either way? I, I, I actually don't at this point. Uh, we're 11 races in. It's been very, very interesting. I think the battle I'm most fascinated on, I, maybe there's two. Can Mercedes catch Ferrari? Ferrari keeps screwing up and Mercedes keeps getting better. And then is Alpine going to beat McLaren? Like that would be, I would love to see that. I, I I want something to really motivate and drive McLaren for next year to keep them. Like they, to see Alpine challenging McLaren, because McLaren's been kind of stagnant as the fourth best team in Formula One for quite a while. I want McLaren to get even better and challenge the big three and Alpine might be the catalyst to do that, to make them go, we got to make changes. We can't be fifth in Formula One. So, um, yeah, it might make a, a complacent or stagnant McLaren have to make changes going into next year. And I, I really, really like that thought. So let me know. What do you think of Formula One so far? Those are my thoughts. 11 races in. Guys, that's all I have. I love you. I appreciate you. I hope you have a great day. Um, thanks for tuning in. And, uh, I don't know if I'll record at the spot again. The planes might be too loud. I'm not sure. We'll we'll edit it and find out. But anyway, love you, appreciate you. But um bum bam, we are.